But today we're, we're continuing a, a series we call Heroes, Now What? And the whole idea is to not end the series, uh, a series of, of talks, of messages, usually studying the Bible, sort of exploring a topic uh, in Scripture, um, and, uh, and, and end it as, as we, it's normally sort of the curve ends in Easter, which is sort of the pinnacle of the whole thing. So we decided to do it the opposite way and start in Easter and say, okay, so when Jesus rose from the dead, what happened next? And how does now, the now what really is about us, right? How does this affect us? Is it, just, is it just a story or is there some supernatural overflow into our daily practical life, right? So that's, that's the, 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 the theme. Today we're going to talk about uh, uh, what happened next in chapter, I think, 3. And, and the title of the talk is Look at Us, and I'll explain why. But, uh, but let, me go back to, let me go back to Russia for just a little bit. You go to, you go to a country that has suffered so much and uh, suffered two world wars. Uh, and I think, you know, when, when you live in America, you, you can't possibly grasp that concept, only intellectually, right? Uh, because if you live through two world wars, everybody in Russia has a relative who died in the war. As a matter of fact, they're, 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 uh, um, they're celebrating Victory Day, May 9th, in a couple of days. And on May 9th, all over the country, people go to the streets, and there's, it, it's called the, um, I, I don't know how to translate it exactly, but almost the Immortal uh, Battalion or something like that, right? And what, uh, what it looks like, it's people call, go to the streets, and they all bring, bring pictures of someone they lost in the war. And they just go down the street, and it's so moving. And it's basically this profound expression of gratitude for the sacrifices. And uh, Russia alone, just, uh, in World War II, lost 20 million people. Imagine, just think about the numbers, right? So, so the, the reason I tell you this is because it's such a long-suffering um, country. It's two world wars. There's um, 75 years under uh, communist regimes, which is just a not fun thing to, to, to be under. And, and, and then some, uh, some, some drama going on right now as well. Um, and yet, at the same time, you go to a conference and, and into a country like that, and you see so much beauty, so much history, and you, then you, you see disciples, followers of Christ. You see the church. And we were, we were privileged to, to speak before and inspire a little conference. It was a worship conference, and there were, uh, there were about 350 people there from 23 different cities. And uh, 23 different cities, what I, what I mean 23 different cities, the farthest one to fly is much closer to the U.S. Than they, than they are to St. Petersburg because it's Vladivostok. Vladivostok is right there by Alaska, right? Right there. Actually, uh, the idea is that uh, the, the Native um, Americans crossed over land many, many, many tens of thousands of years ago, and that's how they inhabited the, the Americas from that area, right? That's how close it is, walking distance, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sort of. Uh, <laughs> um, and then these, you see these people go through great lengths to be together, to worship, to learn, to connect. And it's amazing and moving because the, 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 the contrast between the, the world, people that you see that are you know, good, normal people, and followers of Christ is so drastic everywhere you go. It's so drastic. And the reason I bring this up is because we all are shaped and, and taught and trained by other people uh, in very, very good ways, by teachers, by parents, by leaders, uh, by political leaders, religious leaders. But, and people can change us, but only God can transform us. And that's sort of the topic of today, is that it's the difference between, it's be, it's the difference between sort of step-by-step -step change that we all crave Every single person in this room wants to uh, be less something and more of other, correct? Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah? You want to be less irrit irritable and more patient? Amen. You want to be more faithful? You want to be less fearful? You want to be uh, more loving? You want to be whatever? Fill in, the, uh, fill in the blanks. We probably all have a list, right? And what I'm saying to you is that we can all change. And we can employ people and, and community to change and, 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 and be trained. And that's exceptionally good and important. And yet only God can transform. Only God can make something 
uh, that is completely different out of us, right? So the story I want to read to you is from Acts 3. And this happened after the resurrection, and the apostles were, would go to, at, at the time of prayer to this gate, to, to the temple. And one of the gates at, at the temple was called uh, Beautiful, right? A beautiful gate. Um, and there was this guy sitting there who was uh, uh, lame, he couldn't walk, and he was begging for money. And that's an, not an uncommon sight um, in all kinds of places, especially in the third world. Uh, you, you, if, you know, the, someone with disability uh, just doesn't have opportunities to earn a living. To this day, this is what you can see in marketplaces all over the world, right? So this guy was sitting there, and, uh, and, and basically, he, the, the, the apostles were passing by. The guy asked them for money, which is what he does. And then the apostles say something, something really important. He says, look at us. Look at us. So this is the title of the, of, of the talk. And the reason I tell you this is because this is a significant and profound little detail that we often miss. See, if you are feeling the pain, and all you want is just relief, and this was this guy, you're not really looking. And most likely, if you've ever seen a beggar, uh, in, in, especially in, in the context of the third world, which is, we saw quite a few in Russia just now, is they don't look at you. They look down. All they do is this. Right? So imagine this. Imagine the picture of this man. And the apostles walk by, and the first thing they say is, look at us. Look at our eyes. See beyond what you're seeking. That's what they were saying. And then he said, look, we don't have any money, but we'll give you what we have. And then they commanded him to get up and walk in the name of, of Jesus Christ. And he, he got up and walked, and the account is just bursting with joy. Bursting with joy. If you read it, it's wonderful, right? And then what happened was this, this, this commotion happened. And the, and the story goes that there's, there's people flocking, and because this guy was a well-known guy, everybody knew he was there probably for many years. Actually, the account says that he was over 40 years old, so he probably most likely w was there for decades. So everyone who was in the area sort of knew this guy who sat in this corner every day, and that's what he wanted, right? And, and when Peter saw this opportunity, Peter and John were the two apostles, he addressed them in Acts 3, uh, verse 12. Let's read this together. People of Israel, he said, what is so inspiring about this? And why stare at us though we had made, though, uh, um, as though we had made this man walk by our own power and godliness? And then he points to Jesus, and he says, this, this was done in the, power, in, in, in the name of Jesus. And what he's saying is the same thing that the apostles were saying to the cripple. Look beyond the miracle. Look beyond someone who is sort of an instrument of God. And look at the power that lies behind this. Don't look at us. Why are you surprised? That's what he says, right? Why are you surprised? Because a man would have changed, a generous, kind man would have changed this cripple. He would have given him money. Perhaps even if he was a kinder man, a gen more generous man, someone who would actually be admired. That man would have taken him home, given him a bath, given him some food, maybe give him a place to live, right? That would be a change for the lame man. But only God can transform. And that's what the apostles offered this guy, right? So it's interesting that how does this apply to, to me and to you? Here's how. It's very human to admire someone who has achieved something or who is kind or who is maybe qualified, who is productive. And, and, but it's much easier to admire somebody than to imitate the whys behind this person's life. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this happens all the time. There are people here in church, and, and you might have been one of them, I was one of them, who come to church because they want to do this. Because of this. Right? I just want to feel a little better about myself. I want to be inspired. I want to connect with some people. Uh, I, need, I want the friendship. I, I like the community. I like the music, perhaps. 
Maybe you like the speaker, the one that came before the guy, you know, when he was away. Uh, <laughs> but it's this. It's, this, is, this, is the, this is the posture. This is the posture. And, 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 and you go there to get a little fix, right? And there's nothing wrong with the fix in itself, right? But what is, what, what's wrong with, what, what is incomplete in, in this approach and this posture is that you don't look up. That you don't see the why, be, be, uh, uh, be, the why beyond of what you see, what you experience. You just like the experience, right? So, and every single person comes to God and to church and to the Bible and to community and to small group because of pain. That is just true. Like you wouldn't be here if there was not, not some sort of pain that is bugging you. That is nagging you. That is that won't just won't release, right? It just doesn't happen. I came to the church because of pain. You came to this church because of pain. You might be here right now because of pain. You might be actually not fully even in, but you keep coming back because if something pulls you back, and that has to do with pain. Dan and I went to went we went to a service in. St. Petersburg, I think it was a record for us. We, were, we went to like a church meeting, which is we're sort of Protestant types, right? To so our church meeting. And then we went um, sort of looking, you know, sightseeing. And we ended up walking into an Eastern Orthodox service. Uh, and then on the same day, we, we walked into a Catholic service. So, so Dan and I were joking that we feel like the glow of our faces. We were overflowing with spirituality because we went to three different, completely different denomination services in one day. I've never done that before. Um, and of, of course, that was a joke. We weren't more spiritual at all. Uh, you know, maybe less, I don't know. Uh, but the truth was, is that uh, we looked at all these people and they were uh, congregating in these temples and doing all these rituals. And really what they were doing it, is, it was this. They were not looking at God. And they were not really, and obviously, this is not a blanket statement about motivation in the hearts of every single person in every single temple and every single meeting. But I'm saying that it's, it, it's observable. It's observable uh, that this is the posture rather than looking at God and submitting to God. This is the posture. And... Uh, uh, what I want to plead with you about is this. If you have this pain, if you have this thing that just nags you, that won't go away, if you have an addiction of some sort, if you have, you know, addiction to food, addiction to sex, addiction to porn, if you have issues with anger, if you have these things that usually bring us to our knees, or bring us at least, not, maybe not to our knees, but at least to this, right? Please look up. Please go through the pain of not just admiring someone who is doing better than you, but finding out why. Finding out why. And I'm, honestly, I'm the worst of sinners. I've, I've, when I was studying the Bible, I went through a list in Galatians 5, and every single sin uh, in that list I have done. It's just terrible. But at one point, what, what the, my, my only thing that, I, that, I, that, that was a, just a wise decision on my part is that I looked at someone who brought me to church, and this guy had a great family, and I tell the story all the time, and I, said, and I said to him, how do I get a family like yours? And it was a very simple, and you know, actually, I, I reconnected with him in Dallas just a few months ago, and he goes, I remember that. I remember the look in your eye. I remember how ready to surrender were you. What in your eyes, what you said was, I'll do anything. Teach me. Teach me. And that's looking up. It's not, just, it's not begging. It's like, oh, that's a nice family. I just want to be around you more. Do you see the difference there? That's the difference, right? That's the difference. So why is this important? It's because when you, when you do that, what you will be confronted with is truth. It's biblical truth. And that truth will absolutely and for sure be uncomfortable to you and, and, and require surrender from you and require from you uh, uh, and the, uh, the ability to just say, I, I, I give in, I surrender, I submit, I repent, right? See, what we teach about, what the Bible teaches 
about, and we try to teach about, for example, how do you get a good family, right? It's not really liberal or conservative, it's biblical, right? It's, when we talk about dating culture, it's gonna be a completely different set of ideas and, and, and principles and the why behind the, the things that you will be told in dating culture and it's going to be completely different from what you're used to. Because it's not conservative or liberal or religious. It's biblical. And you either look at it and go, yeah, this is scripture. And, and, go, and say, I will, I will do what God says. And it might seem strange, but I will do what God says. And that's what happened to me. You know, one of the biggest obstacles in, in joining a, the community and becoming a disciple or follower of Christ was the dating culture. As, uh, you know, I had a, my set of ideas of how dating culture should go. And that set of ideas was really submitted to my desire to please myself, to derive pleasure, and to be self-centered. And when, when I was told, well, this is... Well, I, do you want to listen? Yes, I want to listen. Well, this is what the Bible says. And I, t I kid you not, I promise you I kid you not, this is what I said. This is how I, my response, the words out of my mouth was, you don't understand. Yes. To the gentleman who was trying to the Bible, you don't understand. He goes, oh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but the Bible says this, right? So here's what happens next. In, in Acts uh, 2.15, Peter continues on, and, 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 and obviously you, you, see, you see him talking about the, before in Acts 2. Let's read in Acts 2 real quick, because that was really the response of the apostles to any question. Okay, what is happening around here? Why is this so different? He says, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we're witnesses to this fact. Now repent from your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. That's it. That is very, very simple. You killed the Messiah. God raised him from the dead. We're witnesses to this. Now you need to repent. You need to submit. You need to, you need to, you need to understand if you want to look up how, how this whole thing works. Don't be surprised, right? And repent. So what happens next? They get arrested, of course. But it's too late. They get arrested and put in jail overnight. Then they bring it out, and, and, and they bring them out in, in front of the, the council of the leaders. And the leaders say, you know, uh, you guys are causing havoc. Why, why would you do that, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then what Peter says next in Acts 4, he says it in a, in a, not just because he's smart, not because he's trained, but because what the Bible says, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The why was very different. So he says, and he, he goes, you know, you know what, you want to know how he was healed? It was because, uh, because of the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And then he says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the, councils were, of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness in Peter, of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Now note this. Note, note two things in, 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 in this thing. What he's saying is ve it's a very non-inclusive message. There's, he was healed. How was he healed? How was he transformed? Not given some food, not given some money, not just given a bath and by a kind man, you know. Uh, no, how, was he, how is he walking? How was he, his pain transformed into a solution? By the powerful name of Jesus Christ, and by the way, there's no other name by which you can be saved. There's no other way. It was controversial then, and it's still controversial now. Because it's not inclusive, that statement. It could be, it could be construed as arrogant. It, it's not politically correct. It's actually intolerant, isn't it? But it's biblical. And it's not liberal or conservative, it's biblical. 
No other name under heaven by which you must be saved. What are you saying? Are you saying that you can only be saved because of Jesus Christ? Yes. Does it feel good to say that? No. Because I would rather say something else, personally. I would rather say, I'm good, you're good, she's good, we're all good. <laughs> it's just easier, right? It's like, if you want to be accepted by people, isn't that the, better, isn't that the, the logical thing to say? But, but that's not truth. That's not biblical truth. It's just not truth. So, the, so Peter says it. And, it and, and back then it meant you, you'll probably go to jail, you might die. That's what he was doing, right? And then the second thing that they notice is this. It's clear to them that these men are not just good. Because it's clear to them that these men are ordinary. These are ordinary men doing extraordinary things, right? It's clear to them that not, these men were not trained in Scripture. That's, that's what the text says. These are not professionals. It's clear that there's a power beyond of their abilities. There's, it's clear that it's not about people changing you through training, being under rabbi and, and studying for many years, which is all good. But it's clear that a transformation had taken place. And these people were ordinary men. They were doing extra extraordinary things, and they had been with Jesus, right? And of course, they, at the, the, the end of the story is that they tell them, um, <clears throat> not to, not, stop talking about Jesus. And of course, the, the famous line is, is should, do you think I will, we, will, we should listen to you or listen to God? And that's, those are the famous last lines of, of Peter and John. And they, were, they left, and there's so many other stories like that, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll continue going through these stories uh, but, but in, 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 through the series. But I think the question for us is this. Do you want to be... We're all here because of pain of some sort. There's something that we want, or we wouldn't be here. And you have a choice. Do you want, just want to be around people who can change you? And they can. You know, you join a small group. You'll get better at something. You'll get friends. You'll get, you get less lonely. Um, you'll probably learn some skills. You can learn some great skills, actually, in this church if you connect. And that'll be a huge difference, in, make a huge difference in your life. But if you want to be transformed, you need to look up. If you want to be transformed, you need to look beyond what people can give you. But it's scary to look up because God will not negotiate with you. It's scary to look, to look up because God is not going to be politically correct with you. He will tell you truth, and that truth will set you free. Can you do it? Do you want to do it? And that, this applies to both people that are in the church right now because we all need it, right? Right? We all need to look up again, over and over again. Because we all eventually go like this again. Because it's easier. It's easier to beg. It's easier to beg. And it applies to everybody who's just visiting. And you might be a visitor, you might go, okay, I'm not coming back, that's fine. <laughs> totally fine. There's all kinds of communities that, will, that are very designed for this. And they have great songs and great big screens and beautiful leaders and speakers. And let's just do this together. Yeah? In, in a cheerful way. And you might get something too, but you won't be transformed. And you can be in this church, which we don't want to do that. We, we don't want to be those people. We, want to, we don't want to be cultural Christians. We want to be disciples. But you can be, even be in this church and have the outward appearance and behavior of a disciple of Jesus Christ and still be doing this. And what I'm telling you is God is appealing to you through Scripture. Look at us. Look up. 
Stop begging and be transformed, right? Let's pray together.